When we read medieval documents, when we look at the historical photographic record in Eternal Ancestors, we take a step towards understanding not only the power of the artistic expression realized in these objects, but something more about what motivated that expression. All this helps us to understand why objects like these, which were so much a part of the life of a community, were also so often forcibly removed from their original context by people coming from outside those communities. In Africa, they were confiscated by missionaries who, in their zeal, saw them as competition to the new religion. The same was true during the Protestant Reformation. Reformers were iconoclasts, which is why I have no bust reliquaries to show you from medieval England, though there was an important one of St. Thomas Becket at Canterbury, for example. And image reliquaries were melted down during the French Revolution, when the line between church power and state power was blurry and anti-clericalism was rampant. Only images kept in churches away from the urban centers of power survived, tucked in the mountains of the Auvergne and the Rouergue. What's miraculous about these works of art is that, they w that though we don't belong to the community for which they were made and don't necessarily share the belief system that served as the impetus for their creation, the artist has imbued them with effective beauty and presence and power that transcends the limitations that we bring as viewers. That's what makes art seem threatening sometimes to outsiders. But however much we may understand about sociology or about religious history and practice, we are brought up short. We stand in the role of sympathetic observer. Sympathetic, not empathetic. At the end of the day, what's still inadequate about the way we consider these works of art is that we don't and can't belong to the community for which they were made and over which their impact was exponentially more miraculous than it is on us. So, the next time you look at a sculpture in the African galleries or in the medieval galleries, I would invite you to bring something else along with you. A little humility, perhaps, and an awareness that our own experiences and our culture provide our own spiritual or emotional tipping points. I'm sure there are some museum goers who feel quietly superior to pagan African culture. I personally have more experience with those who still call the Middle Ages the Dark Ages. Among other things, these are the people who are squeamish about the notion of Christian relics. Ew, who would keep bones? Well, which mother among you hasn't put a baby tooth in a box or kept a lock of hair? In the Eternal Ancestors catalog, Elisa quotes the historian Gary Will's comments about the supposed disconnect between us, the sophisticates, and the faithful of the Middle Ages. Will says, in my opinion, rather haughtily, it is hard for a modern tourist to understand the devotion to relics. Of all the superstitions we find registered in history, politics, and art of the Middle Ages, Relics can seem the most unconvincing, even the most absurd. It takes some historical imagination to re-enter the value system that structured communities around these sacred items. To us, the artworks celebrating St. Mark's body are far more precious than the relic itself. But people made long and arduous pilgrimages to come within the relic's force field. But I promise you, there are practices, memorials, and celebrations in our society that resonate with the power inherent in Africa's eternal ancestors and the heroic saints of medieval Christendom. It's just that, more often than not, we don't choose to make great works of art to enshrine them. Is that really so sophisticated? Consider this reliquary in waiting. It was featured, in all seriousness, on the front page of, I believe it was, the living section of the New York Times within the last year. It is intended, the sculpture that you see in the middle, for the ashes of the man in the picture when he dies. His wife, seated in red on the left, will ensure that his ashes are placed in it. Ashes, skulls, bones, what's the difference? We are talking about sacred remains. And what have they commissioned to hold them, this couple? 
It's a stylized image of a man. The image has been distilled to its essential forms. Light has been used effectively by the piercing of the metal, and there is an emphasis on balance and symmetry. On another note, if you read your eternal ancestors' catalog attentively, you know the importance of head ornaments in African reliquary sculpture and medieval reliquary sculpture as well. The hat of Chief Fosia, whose commemorative portrait you see, was kept in the treasury with his image. It was a sign of his authority, and it had graced his own head during his lifetime. Now this is easy for us to get. Remember the gut-wrenching feeling after 9-11 of watching a fireman's helmet being carried in procession at a funeral and passed on to his wife or son? As vivid as such experiences are for us to witness, so it was for the communities that created African and medieval reliquary sculpture to honor their heroes. They started with material culture, a hat, a horn. They created works of art. The work of art facilitates the summoning of intense emotion and becomes the focus of that feeling for the individual and for the community down through the generations. And as the immediacy of the presence of the ancestor or the saint or the fireman fades, the work of art increasingly becomes the means by which the shared response is summoned again and again. I don't want to leave you on a somber note. So in closing, I simply invite you to imagine how the Fang artist or the monastic goldsmith would ultimately choose to represent it celebrated in lineage in our culture, say the Manning family or other contemporary American heroes a snow dome of plastic to hold a miniature helmet, a bobblehead doll? I think not. Thank you very much.